uh, it just remains for me to introduce with great pleasure Alan Sly, who's joining us from Princeton. And Alan's going to talk about phase transitions of replica symmetry breaking for random regular NAE SAT. Uh, thanks, Amanda. Oops, sorry, I muted the wrong. Okay, can you uh, can you hear me now? Great. Uh, thanks so much for the, the invitation. It's uh, it's also my first time speaking at Oxford, um, and uh, the uh, the earlier talks were just wonderful. Um, I'm so I'm going to be talking about random constraint satisfaction. Maybe um, more physics, not as many algorithms, but more, but sort of computer science inspired. And so uh, I hope that uh, it's in with the, the theme today. Um, okay, so the first, ah, okay, and I'm just getting a connection. The internet connection is unstable. So hopefully, uh, you know, try and let me, yeah. Hopefully you'll still be able to, to hear. Okay, so uh, okay, so the first part of this talk is going to you know be familiar to experts, and and so you know hopefully those of you who heard me or other people in the area talk about these sort of things uh, before. You know, I guess one of the benefits of an online talk is you can go and uh, read a book or have another coffee while uh, uh, for the first. Part of the talk, so I'll be I'll be talking about um, um, constraints and problems, and that just means exactly what it sounds like. You have a, a bunch of variables, and you want them to simultaneously satisfy a collection of constraints. So imagine uh, solving a system of equations, coloring a graph, satisfying a Boolean formula, and because you know, we do probability, uh, we'll be interested in the random case where the, the the constraints are chosen randomly according to some rule. Okay. So to, to fix uh, to fix some examples of this, we could take our favorite uh, model of a sparse random graph, maybe an erdos renyi random graph or a random regular graph, and ask, okay, can you find a, a proper k coloring of the graph? So here the, the colors of the vertices of the variables, and the constraints at the edges saying that you have to have different colors on neighboring vertices. And since the edges were chosen randomly in the random graph, it's a random constraint satisfaction problem. Um, another sort of combinatorial property um, would be asking, can you find large independent sets in these graphs? Okay. Uh, another type of uh, random CSP uh, come from uh, uh, random Boolean formulas. And so the, the canonical example of this is the, the random case app model. So um, you have uh, you know, N Boolean form variables uh, true or false and for the rest of the talk i'm just going to say plus or minus and the constraints are formed by taking the or of k of the variables or their negation just chosen uniformly at random from the 2k oh, sorry 2n choose k possible uh, um, choices so so one clause uh, or constraint might be something like x3 or x4 or not x5 and then we want all the constraints to be satisfied, so we take the and of them. And this gives us a formula. And when you assign the variables or plug in an assignment of the variables, it evaluates to true. And so that, those will be the solutions of these formulas. And of course, the more constraints you put on, the, the harder it is to find a solution and the fewer solutions you have. So you could parameterize this by uh, alpha, the ratio of number of constraints divided by the number of variables, which is the right sort of parameterization to take. Okay, so we'll, we'll be interested in how things change as a function of, of alpha. And uh, so I'll mention a variant of uh, KSAT, which uh, is called not SAT, and, and it involves, and in this one you ask that both X and the negation of X both satisfy the formula. So the negation being where you just uh, swap the signs of all of the variables. And, and effectively what this means for a particular constraint is that at least one of the terms has to evaluate to true and at least one has to evaluate to false, hence the name not all equal. Um, and just and to make uh, another modification, I'm also going to look at regular versions of, uh, of the not all equal. 
full set um, model. And this is just asked that every variable appears in the same number of constraints. And the reason for asking that, so the regular is kind of the analog of a ran, looking at a random regular graph rather than an Erdős-Rank random graph. So, okay, so, so after I mentioned this sort of uh, not a equal set model rather than the, the sort of standard case at one, it's because it's, um, well, the main reason is because that's the one we have proved uh, the results for. Um, and uh, and it, it has some nice sort of symmetries about it that make it sort of more, most practical models in, uh, in this class of problems. And so oftentimes phenomena are first proved in, in that particular example. Okay. Um, I also want to mention that one can sort of give a, a graphical description of, um, of the, uh, each of these DSPs. Um, and so if we're talking about combinatorial properties of random graphs, it's sort of obvious what the underlying random graph is there. But for the, the Boolean formulas, you can also describe it in terms of a, a factor graph as follows. So if you, if you take the um, SAP formula, you um, construct a, a bipartite graph where you just have one um, variable. Or, so on one side, you have one vertex for each of the variables. On the other side, you have one vertex for each of the clauses. And you just add an edge between a variable and a clause if the variable appears in the clause. Um, because we chose the clauses randomly, it's a, it's a random graph. And like most ensembles of random graphs, it's locally tree-like. You don't expect to see many cycles. Um, and it's especially because of this property of being locally tree-like that um, uh, the practical because if you uh, well, we're having some if you trouble looked at sort of a random solution to a formula yeah um we're, we're having some trouble with the sound i was so, going to sorry, yeah. maybe try switching your video off just to save bandwidth okay sorry about no 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 problem uh okay um yeah yeah and you know if um uh, if you are having, uh, you know, so sometimes um, if I notice uh, that I get a message saying that the internet's having issues, then I might ask and maybe give me an indication when it's it's back again. Um, okay. Um, yeah. So uh, hopefully didn't miss uh, too much, but I was basically just saying that we can encode a, one of these formulas. Um, graphically, and the graphs we get will be will be locally tree-like, and um, uh, and and it's because of this sort of locally tree-like property that we're able to sort of, or you know, uh, physicists or have been able to make sort of precise predictions about the location of different transitions. Um, okay, so what what are we what are we interested in about these? Uh, uh, models. Well, the, you know, the first question would be just when are there solutions to it? So for which constraint densities do you have uh, um, solutions? But once you know the answer to that, there's a lot more questions you could ask. Uh, first of all, how many solutions you, do you have? This would be sort of the free energy, the, the exponential growth rate of the number of solutions. You could ask, what does a random solution look like, maybe locally? Uh, so, so within a, say, a random clause, what's the distribution of the number of the terms that are, are satisfied? Um, you could ask what physicists call overlaps, which is basically just saying you pick two solutions at random and ask, what is their, um, uh, what is their Hamming distance? So, um, and, uh, and the question which I guess we know the least about is the algorithmic question of just when can you find uh, solutions uh, efficient? Okay, and so, so I'll try and address some more of these sort of other questions uh, uh, today. Um, so there are, <clears throat> there are sort of answers to, to most of these questions coming from uh, uh, sort of theoretical physics and particularly the um, 
physicists to study disordered systems such as spin glasses. And, uh, and each of the models I've, I've mentioned lives in the class of uh, one-step replica symmetry breaking uh, sort of universality class. And um, I'm going to try and explain what those, uh, those terms mean as we, as we go along. Um, their work is typically sort of non-rigorous and, and so makes a lot of predictions that are then you know, conjectures for mathematicians to try and prove. Uh, and uh, so, and throughout this talk, I want to sort of describe a, a couple of uh, uh, key sort of heuristics that they, they use. One is uh, replica symmetry breaking, which see is sort of an idea of, like, for the way in which solutions split into to clusters. And, uh, and the cavity method, which is kind of a heuristic for when you sort of add an extra variable into the, into the formula. Okay, so I want to just begin with a sort of fairly uh, simple calculation, which is just to work out the expected number of solutions in, say, the not an equal SAT model. Uh, so Z will be, uh, throughout will be just the, the number of solutions, and it's sort of Z because we can think of it as a partition function when we're looking at sort of the distribution of a, uh, a randomly chosen solution. So Z will be a random variable because the, the problem is random. Um, and so there's two to the n um, uh, assignments of the variables in total. And each clause is satisfied with probability one minus two to the minus k minus one. And they all act independently. So, so there's a very simple formula for the expected value. And it's something like, and which is this, and it's e to the n to uh, times some exponent, which is a function of alpha. Uh, and it's a decreasing function of alpha, as, as you'd expect. And so, the, so we, there'll be some point in which the exponent is zero. And this is where you go from having an exponentially growing number of well, you know, solutions in expectation to an exponentially shrinking number. And so just by Markov's inequality, this says that this must be at least an upper bound on the satisfiability threshold. And so you might, if you haven't heard me give this talk, before wonder, uh, is this the, the right upper bound? And, and the answer is no. And there's a sort of simple way of uh, sort of understanding why it, it shouldn't be. And it's because if you take a sort of typical solution, um, there'll, be, there'll be at least a small fraction of variables which aren't sort of constrained by their neighbors. They're not forced to be either true or false, and, and if you flip them from true to false or false to true, you'd still get a valid solution. Um, and we can, we can find, say, epsilon n of these that are um, sort of separated from each other and, and unconstrained. And so if you have one such solution, then you could flip these epsilon n in any particular way you want and get at least two to the epsilon n other solutions. And so if you plug this fact into Markov's inequality, it would immediately give you just a slightly better bound, which would still be the wrong one, but it sort of makes the point that there's something a bit more complicated going on, but also makes the more important point that when you have one solution, there's a lot of solutions nearby, which is the same as saying that there's some kind of clustering of solutions. And understanding the way in which solutions form clusters is going to be the, really the main focus of the, the talk today. Um, now, the first moment is good for proving upper bounds. Uh, you could use the second moment to try and prove lower bounds. And uh, for this to work, you want uh, the second moment to be of the same order as the first moment squared. And, and actually, um, for not a equal set, for random colorings, this works really quite well. You, get, you don't get a matching lower bound, but the gap between the upper and bound is uh, generally pretty small. Um, on the other hand, for random k set, this doesn't work for, for any value of alpha um, because, it's, because of sort of some uh, uh, local inhomogeneity of the model. Um, and, and so that's one reason why uh, I'm going to talk about the NA, NAE set model. Uh, it sort of simplifies things. But actually, most of the proofs of the satisfiability threshold results rely on sort of more sophisticated applications of the, the second moment method. Okay, 
so so let me now tell you so we'll go into sort of uh, physics mode tell you sort of the heuristic picture that, that uh, they've developed in their theory and um, and then try and understand how we can try and prove some of the aspects of that so um, probably like a some of you will have seen this sort of ink blot like picture uh, um, before um, and what it's supposed to describe is the way in which solutions are uh, um, split into clusters and uh, so what, what is a cluster of solutions exactly well you could think of two solutions that just differ in a single variable or maybe just a small number of variables as being adjacent and if you have a notion of adjacency um, you can also think about, uh, you can talk about connected components. And these will be the clusters, sort of just connected components of solutions. Um, and so, so um, and what this picture is supposed to describe um, is that as the density of constraints um, increases, you get a sort of different picture of clustering. Um, and uh, so the ideas that sort of develop this theory go back to work in sort of the late 70s of uh, Parisi in the, the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, um, but we're sort of in the in this sort of sparse random CSP case we've sort of um, found their final form in work of Krizakula et al in 2007. Um, okay, so, so the, the sort of theory says that when the density is low, then all or almost all of the solutions are in one sort of giant component. But as, uh, as you increase, there's a, there's a threshold, of, a clustering threshold in which the space of solutions breaks into exponentially many clusters, each with just an exponentially small fraction of the number of solutions, and uh, all sort of fairly well separated apart from each other. Um, and and the existence of such a phase was shown uh, in quite a few different models by Akliopoulos and Kodjo Glan. Um, so this, and now this, this clustered regime, as well as the connected one before it, are all in what physicists will call the replica symmetric regime. So, and what that means is essentially, if you pick two solutions at random, um, and look at their say normalized Hamming distance that will be concentrated just at one value so most pairs are the same distance apart from each other and that sort of doesn't matter whether they're sort of clustered or well connected these are all sort of replica symmetric um, then then much closer to the satisfiability threshold there's another transition called the the condensation transition after which you still have lots of clusters but now the biggest few clusters have most of the total number of solutions um, and a, a more refined description of that is that uh, if you look at the, the cluster sizes or the relative cluster sizes they um, form a Poisson Dirichlet distribution um, and now the prediction is that it's replica symmetry breaking meaning that if you pick two solutions at random, look at their normalized Hamming distance, uh, then it will be um, concentrated on more than one point. And in each of these cases, it will just be concentrated on two points. And, um, and why, why is it two points? Well, there's basically two things that can happen. Either you pick two solutions and they're in different clusters, then they're a long way away from each other typically. Or, but you also have a positive probability of picking two solutions and them landing in the same cluster, and then they'll be close to each other. Um, and so, so the reason why you get this sort of replica symmetry breaking in the, this condensed regime is that the biggest um, clusters now have a constant fraction of the total number of solutions. And so it, it's possible to pick two in the same, same one. Oh, I should say, um, like, Replica here just means sort of random sample from the distribution. 
courses. Ability one, I have no more. Which you have no. Alan, we we've uh, lost you. These um. models are called. Oh, um, okay. Uh, um, maybe I'm going to keep. Can you tell me when it's back or? Um, so I we, we we seem to have you back now. Um, so okay. I think uh, we lost you after two uniformly chosen uh, uniformly chosen solutions either being in the same cluster or or, or separated. Okay. Oh, um, yeah. So sorry about that. Um, no problem. Don't the, worry. the uh, yeah. So it's it's replica symmetry breaking when you have uh, two or more. Um, uh, yeah, when the, the normalized Hamming distance can be, can take uh, different values. And, and uh, uh, hopefully you heard the bit where I said, you know, that's because either you can have, you have positive probabilities of both two solutions being in different clusters or two ones being in the same. Okay, and these are one step replica symmetry breaking because there's sort of only one additional distance you can have. The, there are, uh, so the, the normalized Hamming distance is concentrated on two points. Um, the, um, there are other models like, uh, the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, like the, um, or in the sparse case, uh, it would be predicted that the, um, uh, let's say the anti-ferromagnetic easing model on a random graph would be full replica symmetry breaking where the, the distances will have a, maybe a continuous distribution. Um, okay. So that's um, diagram. So this notion of connected components of solutions, though, is not very tractable for doing any calculations. So um, I want to introduce a, a different way of looking at the clusters, which um, goes by different names, but here I'll call the, the frozen model. And um, it's sort of a different representation for a cluster. And so you, you start off by taking just a, a solution to the um, random CSP, which lives in one of these clusters. And, and so it's an assignment of pluses and minuses to each of the variables. And, uh, and then, as I said before, some of the variables are not sort of forced by their, their neighbors. They could be either plus or minus and, and could be flipped without violating any of the constraints. So we'll call these free variables and label them with an F. And labeling some variables as free may mean that other variables can also be uh, uh, labeled as free. So we sort of iterate this and, and keep going until we can't label anything else as free. And, and then we end up with a, um, each, each variable being assigned either plus, minus, or free. And, and, the, and the idea is that um, actually every solution within the cluster is going to be mapped to the same configurations of plus, minus, and threes. So it will sort of project uh, this sort of big complicated cluster just to a single point in this sort of slightly bigger space. Um, and, and this um, frozen model configuration of plus, minus, and threes, um, this is uh, actually a new constraint satisfaction problem. So it satis has to satisfy a certain set of rules. So the free variables are not, cannot be forced by any clause and because otherwise we wouldn't have set them to be free. Conversely, the, the pluses and minuses um, must be forced by at least one clause and uh, because otherwise we would have set them to free. And any clause that only has pluses and minuses in it must be not violated. Um, so this is a new um, random CSP. Um, but it sort of looks more complicated than the original one. So what was, what, why did we want to do this? Well, it turns out the frozen model um, doesn't have clustering. So the, the points um, in the space of solutions you get are all sort of very isolated from each other. There's a certain local rigidity in, in the model. Um, and one way you can see why it should have a sort of local rigidity is that if you you could define a configuration on say the, the infinite tree and then ask, what do you have to do to change to another valid configuration on the infinite tree? And the answer is you have to change an infinite number of the variables to go from one valid configuration to, the, to another. Um, 
And that sort of suggests that sort of on the finite graph, it should also be hard to go from one solution to the other. And, and indeed, typically, you have to make big changes to go from one valid configuration to the other. So, so the frozen model, um, in fact, becomes uh, replica symmetric, even when the, the original um, model was uh, uh, replica symmetry breaking. Okay. So, so now I want to um, talk about uh, um, the cavity method, which is a, another heuristic from, from physics. And it's basically saying what would happen if you added in one extra variable. So you go from n variables to n plus one variables. So imagine we know what we have n variables to begin with, and we know what a random um, solution looks like. And, and if, I, if I gave you a collection of, of the variables, you could tell me what the joint distribution was. So in particular on these, these green ones. Then we add in a new variable connected to some, some random variables in the, in the graph. And uh, we could ask, okay, what is, the dis what is the marginal distribution at this, this new variable? Well, if we, knew the, if we knew the joint law on these green ones um, before we added in the new variable, then essentially you can use sort of some phase rule calculations and some fairly simple calculations to work out the, the marginal at the new variable. And you could also work out the, the change in the partition function, or at least the multiplicative change. And that would be really useful because then you could sort of start from, you know, a very small uh, CSP and build up one variable at a time and, and write um, the sort of log of the partition function as a, as a sum of log of these ratios as a um, sort of telescoping sum. Um, so that would be, that would be useful, except um, how do we know what the, the joint distribution on these, these green variables should be? Um, Okay, well, the, the heuristic um, would be that if we're in the replica sy symmetric range, that the green variables should be independent. They may have a different mark, they might not be identically distributed, but their law will be drawn randomly from some law mu. Um, okay, uh, but that, that will break if it's, um, if things are, um, you know, in the condensation regime where it's replica symmetry breaking, essentially because within each cluster, it should be replica symmetric. But when, then when you take a mixture over the different clusters, it's no longer, rep, uh, you know, uh, the distributions will no longer look like product measures because, you know, a, a mixture of product measures is typically not a product measure. Okay. And, uh, and so the, but the one RSB heuristic sort of, you know, says that if we look past the frozen model, then this should be replica symmetric. And so, so we should be able to treat the, the, the green variables as being independent. Of course, we also need to know what law mu they were drawn from. Um, that's sort of unspecified here. But there's sort of a self consistency that you can assume, which is along the lines of saying that, well, if we had, you know, a system with n variables and one with n plus uh, one variables, uh, should look more or less the same. And this new yellow variable will just be like a randomly chosen variable in the whole system. So its law should also be drawn from mu. But we also know its law in terms of what the law of the green ones was. So that's saying that essentially mu should be equal to some function of mu which means that basically there's a fixed point equation that takes the form of a measure re valued recursion that mu should satisfy. Um, and so, so if you can solve that for mu, then you can sort of um, work out sort of the, the growth rate of the partition function. Okay, so just to give you an example of what those calculations would look like for the, for the not all equal sat model. Um, so this, um, because it's, regular it makes things a lot easier actually and so the, the measure of valued recursion just becomes a recursion of uh, um, like a function like, like just a, a simple recursion of a function taking real values rather than measure values and so you just solve this for q and q is basically just the probability that uh, a variable will be 
um, set of plus, say, uh, in this uh, frozen model. And then, and then the next formula is sort of is saying what's the change in the number of um, clusters or uh, or frozen model configurations as you go from n variables to n plus one variables. And so, um, so this is just a Bayes rule calculation essentially. And then the prediction for when um, when it's satisfiable is just the point at which this is zero. The point where the the number of um, clusters or frozen model configurations goes from growing exponentially to decreasing exponentially. Um, and so, so at least when uh, K was large enough uh, with uh, Ding and Sun, we, we established this a, a while ago. So this sort of tells you when there will be solutions, but and now for the rest of the talk, I want to discuss sort of what we can say, you know, about you know, the, the condensation regime. Okay, but may, maybe I should pause for a moment in case there's any questions there. Okay, so, so we want to go beyond the satisfiability regime now. And so I'm going to do some more heuristic calculations, which is to just break the expected number of uh, solutions up uh, according to class. The, the, the different cluster sizes. So we could look at clusters of size about e to the ns and uh, multiply that by the number of clusters of that size. And let's make sort of a you know, leap of faith that that grows like e to the n times some function sigma of s, where sigma is sometimes called the complexity function. So just assume such a function exists for now. So because this uh, expected value is now on an um, exponential scale, the biggest contribution or the dominant contribution will come when you maximize s plus sigma of s. And that's equivalent to looking at the point where the derivative of sigma is minus one. Um, okay, and there's sort of reasonable reasons why sigma should be um, concave here. Okay, so this is what the picture should look like in the clustered regime. The in the condensation regime, it should, the, this tangent point should lie on the x-axis. In, inside the condensation regime, uh, it should be strictly below the x-axis. The satisfiability threshold should be the last point at which you have any clusters of any size, so the maximum uh, lies on the x-axis. And then in the unsatisfiable regime, you have no solutions of any size. Um, okay, so let, let me just um, focus on what's happening in the, the condensation regime now. So the dominant contribution to the expected value um, is, uh, is given by a cluster size that's exponentially rare. So you don't expect to see any solutions um, of that size at all. Uh, and, and consequently, the typical number of uh, solutions is much smaller than the expected value in, in this regime. And, and indeed, if you look at the free energy, the, um, there'll be a, non-analyticity, um, which would be a, a second order phase transition at the, um, at the condensation threshold. Okay, but if you, okay, so if, if these cluster sizes that dominate the expected value don't appear, what is the, what should the typical value be? Well, it should be the, the largest cluster size that actually does happen. So, so the, the largest um, non-negative value of sigma. And, and now, so how many do you expect to see? Well, you expect to see e to the zero of them, so order one clusters of that size. And that's why in the condensation regime, you expect it to be dominated by a constant number of uh, clusters. Um, now, if you made a, a sort of even bigger leap of faith and, and said that this sigma was not just sort of telling you the expected number of clusters of a particular size, but was really encoding the density of some Poisson process, then that would lead you to the, the conclusion that uh, you should see a Poisson Dirichlet distribution for the cluster sizes. Okay, so if you take all this information, you can, you can just write down um, formulas for the satisfiability threshold, for the condensation threshold, for the free energy in the condensation regime, for um, all of this in terms of sigma. Um, but of course, we haven't 
actually shown that sigma exists um, or calculated what it is. Okay, but I should say a, a lot of um, a lot of these predictions have been um, verified now, and it looks like the sound is unstable. So maybe let me know if you can hear me or not hear me at some point. Can you just sort of um, go back just to the beginning of this slide? We we lost you for a sort of sentence. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Um, just saying that all of this can be uh, like if you know what's if we you knew what sigma was you could just read off all of these uh, quantities of interest the satisfiability threshold the condensation one the free energy so basically the number of solutions in the condensation regime and and then the next thing i wanted to say was okay now some of these uh, uh you know quite a few of these predictions have been verified um so condensation regime uh, thresholds, uh, the, the sort of first one of that sort was work of Kojo Glan and his, his group on um, colorings of GMP. Um, um, and, and actually it turns out that the satisfiability threshold is maybe the easiest one of these questions and, and that's, uh, there's the most results for, for that one. And, and all of, and I should say, all of these come with sort of a um, large K as a um, sort of caveat, um, and that's because essentially things are things become more concentrated and easier to deal with when when k is large. Okay, so now, how can you say something about what um, sigma is? Well, we can. Um, you know, the the expected value of z is telling us something about the. Um, the point at which this has derivative sigma has derivative minus one and it's really looking at you're maximizing s plus sigma of s and that's the exponential exponent and if you're looking at the expected number of clusters you would be uh, just maximizing sigma so that's the point at which the derivative is zero but now we're interested in this point the tangent the the the, the root on the the x-axis where the derivative will be lambda which is somewhere between uh or minus lambda, where lambda is somewhere between zero and one. And so for that, you would want to maximize lambda s plus sigma of s, which is equivalent to computing a partition function z lambda, which will mean summing over all of the clusters of their size to the power of lambda. So, so um, which initially might think you might think is not a very nice calculation to try and be trying to do because we've got these sort of connected components of solutions and then we're raising them to some non-integer power. Okay, but bear with me for a, for a moment. Um, so, but first of all, if we could, if we could calculate uh, these sort of normalized log of um, partition function z lambda, we would essentially be computing the Legendre transform of sigma of s. So you could, you could back out sigma of s if you could work out these uh, expected values. And the reason why it's, it's possible to do that is, is z lambda is really the partition function of a, a weighted version of the frozen model. So where we weight, uh, give certain weights to the uh, assignment uh, to the free variables. Um, so, so in the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll say how to do that. And so the idea is um, uh, the, if you, the free variables will be pretty rare. So most of them will just be sort of isolated singletons. And, uh, and then a few of them will be connected to each other in small trees, but the trees will be very subcritical. Um, it's, it's not unlike the, the, the sort of cluster expansion picture that Will talked about earlier, where you have just sort of a, a dominant, um, you know, most of the things are in one state, and then you have just sort of small perturbations away from that. Um, okay, but then we want to sort of say for these free variable trees of free variables, how many ways are there to assign the uh, sort of valid solutions to them? So if, if the free variable is just a singleton, it's two, but if there's more of them, then it's essentially a two sat formula. Um, so, so the way we handle this is we sort of um, take a bijection to this, the frozen model where we sort of 
you have different types of free variables, which basically mean that the free variables know what sort of free tree of free variables they sit inside and, and where they sit inside that tree. And then if you, have a, if you have a tree of free variables and you want to know how many ways of assigning that, you can do that using what's called a belief propagation algorithm. And the number of solutions in that particular tree will just be a product of certain weights that you can calculate. So, so you can give weights to each of the free variables and actually not just the variables, but the clauses between them and the edges between the clause and the variable, such that if you multiply all those weights together, you get the number of ways of assigning the free variables in the tree to give you a valid solution. And then if you multiply those weights across everything in the, in the graph, you just get the size of that cluster. So the number of solutions in that cluster, because the, the trees are separated from each other. So it's just the, the product of the number of ways of assigning each of the trees. And then if you want the size of the cluster to the power of lambda, you just take the weights to the power of lambda. So then Z lambda is the partition function of the frozen model with these, these weights to the power of lambda. And uh, so then that's, that's what we want to try and work with. Okay, so, so then we want to take its expected value. And for that, we can sort of sum over pairs of graphs and configurations of these weights to the power of lambda. And, and the way you can sort of do that uh, computation is um, uh, condition uh, on nu, which will be the number, um, which will be like the empirical distribution of, of a configuration. So essentially, how many pluses you have, how many minuses, how many free variables of each type, and sort of how many pairs are next to each other of one type and another. And once you know that, then the expected contribution of that empirical distribution nu is just some product of weights and times some product or ratio of multinomial coefficients. So you can apply Stirling's formula a bunch of times and get e to the n times some function phi lambda of nu. And so then the dominant contribution will just come when you maximize this function phi. But phi is kind of a nasty function. It's sort of fairly high dimensional and it's, um, it's non-convex. It could have multiple maxima. But you can, you can describe the optimum of, 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 new, of phi um, in terms of fixed points of certain belief propagation equations. So in some work from a, a few years ago with um, uh, Nike Sun and Yu Meng Zhang, we, we carried this out for the not equal set model, the regular not equal set model, again, when K is very large, when uh, in the condensation regime, um, to get the sort of exponential growth rate of the number of solutions. And so the way we did that was we took, we said, okay, these three variables come in subcritical trees, um, but um, the, uh, you know, so, so they could be arbitrarily big, but we actually just wanted a lower bound. So we could truncate the size of the free trees at some point and then do this computation on, on that model, do the second moment method and, uh, and show that it, um, show that you, you indeed have solutions of the, the right size. Um, the upper bound can be, can be done sort of separately using a, a technique called the interpolation method. So this, this was able to sort of work out what the exponential growth rate of the number of solutions was, but not sort of finer details than that. And in particular, it wasn't sort of detailed enough to be able to tell you things like um, that you have this sort of replica symmetry breaking property where if you, if you pick two solutions, they could either be close to each other or they could be far apart. So, so the most recent result, which um, you know, we'll hopefully be finished writing soon, um, but will be, um, will, uh, says that you can actually do this estimation up to just a, a constant multiplicative error. Um, and so with high, and so in particular with high probability, if you look at the largest cluster and the second largest cluster, 
they both have a constant fraction of the total number of solutions. And so, so if you pick two solutions, you have a, a constant probability of, uh, and look at their normalized Hamming distance, it will be concentrated on two points. Now, actually this two points is a lie. Uh, it's really on three points. Um, and the reason for that is that it's, um, you can, every cluster has sort of a negative cluster associated with it with itself. So because if X is a solution of not an equal set, minus X also is. So really, um, I didn't want to sort of get into the details of this earlier, but really each cluster has a, has a, a paired cluster with it. Um, it's sort of the same as if you said, well, for every coloring of a graph, there's, you know, K factorial other permutations of the colors. Um, Okay, so, so, so actually, if you pick two solutions at random, there's really three things that can happen. One is they're in sort of unrelated clusters, and then the, the Hamming distance um, is about, um, well, the normalized Hamming distance is about uh, one half. If you, if you pick two solutions that are in the same cluster, um, then the normalized Hamming distance will be like really small like delta, say delta, and if you pick them in sort of the negative clusters of each other, then it will be like one minus delta. Um, and each of these scenarios happens with a positive probability. Although the, 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 um, so the probability will be sort of not too, not too small, but it will be a, a random variable depending on the actual clusters that you've got. Um, and, and so in order to do this, the, the, main, the main challenge from, from before was um, you really have to be able to deal with the, uh, the very large um, clusters of free variables that you can get. So they look like subcritical branching processes, but if you have n subcritical branching processes, some of them will be of size log n. Um, and so, I mean, I guess this is, this is kind of, in a sense, analogous to uh, uh, to to Will's talk, where you know most you you don't get very many big clusters, but there will be a few that will be of size that will be of logarithmic size. Um, and so, if if you try and do this this expansion from the previous sli slide using um, uh, Sterling's approximation, it won't work. Um, when, when you have sort of just uh, uh, so many different uh, possible trees of free variables. And so, so what we needed to do was essentially um, fix the, um, the frozen variables that are either plus or minus, um, and then also the small trees of free variables, and then um, give a way of, of summing over all the possible big trees of free variables and the number of ways of assigning the variables within those free variables and to um, in order to you know get a sort of precise enough calculation to be able to um, show this sort of replica symmetry breaking um, and i think maybe uh, that's a good place to start so thanks for listening Thank you very much, Alan. And in particular, thank you for battling on at the points when we were having sound problems. Um, that was nonetheless an extremely clear talk. Um, uh, I'd like to invite people to ask questions. Um, if you'd like to just say in the chat that you have a question, please go ahead. And perhaps I can start with one. So you mentioned along the way Poisson Dirichlet cluster sizes. Is there any model where that's close to being proved or does that sort of have the, the, the status of kind of far away conjecture? Um, so, so in the in the sort of denser models, where like the the Sharrington Kirkpatrick model, those sorts of things are known. Um, but yeah, in in the, at least in this sort of sparse one RSB um, set of uh, um, models, I, yeah, I don't uh, um, I don't know that we're that close to being being able to prove that. Um, yeah, at least I'm not, uh, and 
And then, and then perhaps something yeah. which is a sort of uh, maybe a more stupid question. Uh, you mentioned that K has to be very large. How large is very large? Um, sort of embarrassingly large, I think, is the answer to that. Um, large, I, I mean, there's just a there's just a lot of places in the proof where you want to say something like. Um, you know, k to the four times two to the minus epsilon k is small, and then how you'd have to sort of track through how big k should be for that. And there's, I, I mean, yeah, in I think in principle, there's nothing, no reason why one couldn't go through all of the um, all of the proof and really work out what. Uh, what sort of K uh, would work. Um, for, some, for some simpler papers, I've tried to get students to, to go ahead and do that, and I've never succeeded uh, uh, with that. Yeah. That is an exercise. Is an exercise but, um, but, um, oh, no, I'm getting some feedback. Um, yeah, so, but, but I mean, in, so, so really in principle, like in, in terms of the truth, there's nothing stopping it working all the way down to the k equals three. Uh, so we'd expect that all, all of this phenomenon to work for all k greater than or equal to three. Uh, k equals two is kind of special, uh, but um, but yeah, it's just many things become easier when k is larger. Thank you very much. Um, so I can't see any other questions in the chat, and I can't see any hands raised either. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to stop recording, and then I'm going to unmute everybody. And I'd like to invite us to thank um, all three speakers um, from this afternoon.